Good morning. My name is Keith Tebow. I'm Director of Television Services at Bristol Community College and also the Director of FRC Media, Fall River's public communications outlet here in the city of Fall River. FRC Media, in partnership with the BCC Communication Program, is uh, pleased to welcome you today with what we hope will be the first in a developing and ongoing series where we feature leaders within the media and communications fields. And definitely our first guest today is definitely a trailblazer when it comes to the field of journalism. Jim Terracani recently retired from WJAR Channel 10, where he served over 30 years. Is that correct, Jim? Over mm -hmm. 30? As its lead investigative reporter, Jim has won five Emmy Awards and the Edward R. Murrow Award for investigative journalism. Please join me in welcoming Jim Terracani. Jim, uh, thank you for joining us. Sure. And we want to make this definitely an, an interactive uh, event here today. Uh, those of you here at Bristol Community College, please feel free to uh, ask any questions of Jim. I'll take uh, some, some opportunities during the event to ask for questions from people here at BCC. We're also uh, willing to ask for those of you who may be watching at home here on uh, April 14th as we're broadcasting this live on FRC Media to uh, tweet us some questions for Jim. Please, if you're on Twitter and you'd like to ask Jim a question via Twitter, please use the hashtag BCC Talks, B-C-C-T-A-L-K-S, and we'll uh, weave in some of those uh, conversations as we go toward, uh, toward the morning. We're going to cover uh, much of Jim's career and also get his thoughts on journalism in general over the years and where he sees it going forward. Jim, I must ask you a question, though. You've been retired now for a whole two weeks. <clears throat> right. Are you, uh, are you ready to get back? Or do you miss it at all? No. <laughs> the I short still, answer is no. Uh, I still write for Rhode Island uh, Monthly Magazine. Uh, I do some work. I've done some work for the Phoenix uh, newspaper in the past, and I'm working on a book. So, About your journalistic career? No. Totally different? Totally different. Right. Any hints? Can you it's tell about, what it's about a um, Rhode Island state trooper who infiltrated the mafia for six years, um, made a lot of cases out of that. His story has never been told, so I'm going to take a stab at that. No. Oh, <clears throat> look forward to seeing that when it comes out. Let me ask you, Jim, uh, from the beginning, how did, how did you get the journalism bug? Was it something you always had, uh, or was it something that developed as you were growing up? Uh, I started off as a musician, uh, so I had nothing to do with journalism, and I never even thought about journalism. But in college, uh, I was in a band. Uh, this was in Connecticut, and uh, we were going to try to make a go of it. This is, I'm really old. This is way back in the 60s, uh, where a lot of bands had a shot at making it. Uh, we didn't make it. Um, and so uh, while I was at school, I had an interest in writing. So I became editor of our uh, college literary magazine, and I did a lot of work for the newspaper. And as a, as a kind of a standby for our, our budding musical career, I went to the Connecticut School of Broadcasting just so in case the band didn't work out, I could be a DJ someplace. And um, with that in my back pocket after I got out of college, uh, I had nothing to do. The band fell apart. So I just sent out uh, <laughs> resumes and audition tapes to radio stations and newspapers, and I got hired by a small radio station in West Warwick, Rhode Island. And at the same time, within a week, I was hired by a, a small newspaper in uh, West Warwick, Rhode Island, and that's where I started my career. So you started mainly doing news right, right oh, away? Yeah, it was all news, right. So you had no formal training other than no. just being a DJ in terms of your Connecticut School of Broadcasting. Yeah, the career. broadcasting part was just what you learned at broadcasting right. school, but uh, writing is writing, and uh, I felt I could teach myself news uh, since so much of it had to do with writing. And I was lucky enough at my first newspaper job to have a really good editor. He was a young guy who went on to bigger and better things, but uh, the best way to learn uh, journalism is to do it and then get corrected by somebody who knows a lot more than you do. And uh, that first year of writing taught me an awful lot about journalism. I was lucky to have a good teacher. So let me ask you then, what were some of your mentors? Who, who did you look up to as you were developing your, your, your journalistic skills? Well, after a couple of years <clears throat> at a small station, I was hired by the Providence Journal's all news radio station at the time, WEAN in Providence. And um, there was this bar in Providence. It was called Hopes. And it was this legendary place where writers and actors and artists and reporters hung out a lot. And uh, I started hanging out there, and I met a guy by the name of Jack White. Jack White um, was the investigative reporter for 
the Providence Journal. He won the Pulitzer Prize in 1974 for proving uh, that President Nixon cheated on his income tax return. And um, he took me on as a mentor. We uh, took a liking to each other. <clears throat> he was covering the mafia at the time, and the mafia at the time was headquartered in Providence, Rhode Island. And so he kind of showed me the ropes on how to cover the mob, introduced me to a lot of really good law enforcement sources, and those law, law enforcement sources are something you certainly need to cover organized crime. And we struck up a friendship, but he was just an amazing, amazing reporter. Mm -hmm. And I looked up to him, and he taught me. Uh, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have a career, put it that way. And of course, Jack, for many years, worked at Channel 12 right. as the investigative reporter there. Um, so what got you into, what got you to Channel 10, I guess, is my next question. Well, I was, uh, actually, it was all by accident. Um, when I was working at the Providence Journal's all news radio station, I was freelancing for Associated Press, the Bureau in Providence, and I took a real interest in Associated Press writing. Yeah. And so I was in the process of applying to Associated Press to take a position with the AP in Boston. And out of the blue, uh, I'm just totally out of the blue, I got a call from the news director at Channel 12 television. And because I was breaking a lot of stories at this radio station, he said, why don't you come on and try TV? And I hated television. I hated people in television. I wanted nothing to do with television. So, um, but he offered to make me this investigative reporter and have a budget for the investigative team. So it was attractive, so I took the position. Uh, but after a year, uh, the funding fell through for the investigative team. So I was about to go back and reapply to Associated Press when, again, out of the blue, Channel 10 called, said there was an opening. I went there and I established the investigative team and I stayed there. Ever since. Ever since. Yeah. I never knew you had that Channel, that channel 12 connection. Right. Briefly. Yeah. Briefly. Um, when when <clears throat> you got to, 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 to Channel 10 and um, they, they invited you to be part of their investigative team, were there any limits? What were, what were any parameters that, that you needed to follow? Well, there, 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 was, there was no investigative team. Okay. They asked me to create one. So you I it. created one. So I hired two producers. And producers in investigative teams, they're actually reporters. The two other reporters are Gary Serka and this woman, Polly Reynolds. And um, we had a great photographer, Bob Emerson. And we put together this team and we started doing what, what's in broadcasting because it's a long form um, reporting on air. Usually you see something on TV, it lasts a couple of minutes. We were doing 15, 20 minute pieces. Right. We uh, developed a program called 10 Inside where we would do half hour pieces. And so that's where we started, you know, making our way in the investigative report, reporting world. Now, of course, e even now in some respects, but sp specifically back then, you talk about investigative teams have, have longer time, also takes longer to develop some of the stories. Right. So there's a difference between being just a general assignment reporter that will oh, go sure. out to cover right. meetings, uh, murders, uh, police mm -hmm. stories. So. Uh, did you ever do any of that, or were you just mainly investigative? I did. Uh, that's called general assignment reporting. Right. I did a little bit of that. I did some of it at Channel 12 and a little bit of it at Channel 10, but I basically got into the investigative reporting uh, end of it, and you have a lot more time to work on your story. One of my first investigations at Channel 10 took three months, and I traveled around the country to get the story. So that's the type of thing, and I wasn't on the air for three months, so you, th that's the type of thing you have to do. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. Was there any pressure at all to say, hey, you know, we've paid this Terracani guy to, to do stuff. And even mm -hmm. though they know you're working behind the scenes, was there uh, an expectation for at least have your face somewhere on air? To no, the, uh, <clears throat> the news director at the time, my boss, was very understanding of the needs of uh, investigative reporting. Uh, there's more pressure now because uh, investigative reporting is very popular on commercial television. So they want you on the air as much as possible. So it's a little more, <laughs> little more difficult now to get the time for those long extended stories that may take a month, two months, three months to produce. But if you had something really good and it looked like it was gonna turn out to be a story, you'd probably get permission to do it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I'll get into how it's changed since mm. you started and since you've since retired on how investigative reporting has, has changed. But I wanna get a little bit into uh, some of the highlights of your career. And, and those of you who are my age and maybe a little older, mm. uh, know of a lot of, of Jim's work and I want to get into it. For, and it's a good history lesson, not only for journalism students, but also the history in some respects of Rhode Island. There's a lot of things that Jim covered uh, were not only covered locally, but in many cases covered nationally as well. Um, you talk about your years with the mafia mm. and covering the mafia over 25 years. Uh, my first question is a simple one. How do you prepare <laughs> to cover 
a beat like the Mafia? Well, I, uh, I don't know how you prepare, you prepare? for it, but I, I mean, the best thing is to find a mentor, and I did, as I mentioned, right. Jack White. Uh, to, to, to cover the Mafia, at least when you're starting, you have to have some really good sources in, in the law enforcement community because you really can't get at these people. And the law enforcement community would, would do all the surveillance and they'd have a lot of intelligence information about who was who in the local mafia. So luckily, uh, Jack introduced me to a couple of those types of sources. But you have to do a lot of your own work. I would do, uh, the, the, the headquarters for the New England Mafia was located in Providence, Rhode Island on Atwell's Avenue in a place called the National Vending Company, which was owned by this guy, Raymond Patriarca. And uh, he was the boss for the, the entire New England Mafia. So you can learn a lot about the Mafia because the Mafia, by, by watching them, the Mafia is all about associations. And so I would do a lot of surveillance up on the hill, uh, sitting in a car, sitting in a coffee shop, and see who was associating with who. Uh, there was this underboss, Nicky Bianco, a very powerful guy. He came from the Gambino family in New York. And um, you know, if, if people were walking up to the street on, uh, and meeting with Nicky, other mob guys, you know you knew that those guys were in favor with the mob boss because he was the ender boss for the mob. But if they were meeting with other wise guys and ignoring Nicky, there would be another, another faction of the mob that they were uh, involved in. And so you can learn a lot by who was meeting with who and who was talking with who. And it meant something in the hierarchy of the mob. You could figure out who the boss was, uh, who was important, who was not important. And there was a lot of that type of work. Uh, and, and then you would also take advantage of your sources in law enforcement. And a lot of those, those sources, and I, I want to get into sourcing a little bit a, as well here, but um, it, it's something that you have to build a trust, mm -hmm. not only you them, but them you as well. Oh, sure. To, yeah. to say, when you call someone, say, from the police department that, that's one of your sources, hey, what's going on with X, Y, and Z, they've got to know that you each, you each have each other's back, correct? Right, yeah, it's difficult to develop sources. Um, they have to have a, a lot of trust in you that whatever information they're gonna give you, you use it the right way. Uh, you don't uh, ever disclose who they are, and that takes some time. You gotta get to know these people. You go out socially with them. Uh, they give you a little bit of information. You do a story. They see you did it right. They'll give you a little more next time. So it's, uh, it's, it's a difficult thing to do, but obviously it's done, it's done a lot. Every, every good reporter in this country has his or her confidential sources for sure. Yeah. When you were out covering not only uh, stories involving the mob, but <clears> any <throat> other uh, stories where there could be um, danger of even your life, did you have any police with you? Did you, did you have any, any security at all when you were out or was no. it just you and camera person? And no, it was, uh, you, you, no, I wouldn't have any security. That, you know, there's a, a line between law enforcement and reporters and you really can't cross it. You right. know, you can't do their work, they can't do your work. Um, after all the years I covered the mafia, I was only threatened, half threatened once by a, by a mob guy, uh, mm -hmm. but it was okay. I mean, nothing ever happened, so, <laughs> <laughs> obviously. <'cause I'm> here. <laughs> right. He's, Jim's here today, so we're, we're good. But any, any time that you were ever fearful, depending on what the you The only time I was, well, I was concerned was um, along the way I became friends with this made member of the mob, this guy, Nicky Palmagiano. Nick Palmagiano was a hit man for Ray Patriarca. He had killed two, two people on orders from, from the mob boss. And Nicky ended up ratting out the mob boss and he went into the Federal Witness Protection Program. And Nicky wanted me to write his book, uh, his life story. So I agreed, started doing a lot of interviews with him. He was relocated to a different part of the country. Uh, but one of the first meetings I had with Nicky to work on this book, I convinced him to do a TV interview also. So uh, myself, my producer, and my, my camera man, uh, we had to meet him at a motel in New Jersey. So he was, he was relocated to California. So he flew in uh, and we, had, we met him at, this, at the airport, picked him up. And now keep in mind, all the time, he had a $100,000 contract on his head for ratting out the mob boss. So he was, you know, if another guy in the New York Mafia or anybody who knew him saw him, they would just kill him, just right on the spot. So um, we had dinner and we had two motel rooms. We booked two rooms. And Nikki said to us, the three of us, he said, okay, so who's sleeping with me? So my, uh, <laughs> my photographer and my producer looked at me and said, no, asshole, you, 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 yeah, nah. we're not sleeping with him. So I, I, I had to share the room with Nikki. And we got in the room and he pulled out a gun. He put it on the, uh, the nightstand. We had two the twin beds. And he said, don't worry, if anybody comes through the door, I'll take care of them. And I'm thinking there, I was a pretty young guy at the time, and I'm thinking I'm sleeping with a mafia hitman 
and he's talking about somebody coming through the door and he's going to take care of him, you know. So that it was a little bit of concern, right. but uh, I mean, obviously nothing happened, and we did a great interview, and uh, the book eventually fell through. But it was right. fascinating talking to him about the mafia. Talk about the patriarchal crime family. Um, you never interviewed any of the, the patriarchs, did you? Oh, sure. And mm -hmm. and. How did you find them? Were they willing to talk to you about certain, what, what was that relationship like? I stupidly walked in on the mob boss's office because I thought I should get his comment for a story. And I pushed his door open into his inner office at the National Vending Company. And he stood up and he screamed at me and he said, get out of my effing building or I'll have you killed. <laughs> and I thought, oh, this is not really good. So I left and um, he called me up later and he gave me a comment. And his son, who's known by a lot of people as Ray Jr., called me later and said my dad respected the fact that you tried to get his comment. Uh, and so this kind of relationship went on over the years. I would always talk to Mr. Patriarca. And when he died um, uh, at his wake at the Baraducci Funeral Home in Providence, Junior came out and he handed me this rose, said my dad would want you to have this. And actually Junior invited me into the wake because he knew I was writing the book with Nicky Palmigiano. And he said, I want you to get it all right for the book. I want you to see how many politicians and priests sent my father flowers. And the bishop sent him flowers, every prominent politician f sent him flowers. And so he just, he said, I can't, couldn't use it on TV, I could use it for the book, but uh, so it was that kind of relationship. Was the, the presentation of the flower public? Are oh yeah, it was on the middle of the street, oh yeah. The other oh, reporters yeah. look made, at you like, made the front page of the Boston Globe, yeah. Is right. this a sign? <laughs> Obviously it wasn't. Mm. <clears throat> uh, um, what, what did you learn? In, in how different ha has the mafia changed, I guess, over the years? Is it still no, a force the, today? The FBI has pretty much decimated the mafia, especially around here. There's nothing really left in Providence. So there's a, two or three guys in their 80s who drool in their soup and they couldn't do anything to anybody. Uh, there's a few guys left in, in Boston. The five families uh, that TV programs and movies are made about in New York, the Genovese, the Gambinos, Lucchese, they're still there, but uh, it's mostly white collar crime now and it's not as violent as it used to be. And where they used to have this code of omerta, where it means you get sworn into the mafia and you never you know, say that you're in the mafia, you never rat anybody out, that's all changed. People become rats like this as soon as they're threatened with jail. So it's probably pretty much gone away for the most part. How much yeah. of it did you cover toward the end of your, your career? Or was oh, it still something you kept in ear to? Oh yeah, uh, three years ago, uh, they took the last of the mob guys in, in, in Providence, including the most recent boss, this guy, Louis Baby Shax Monocchio. And he and about six other guys were involved in a racketeering ring, shaking down local strip clubs for money, for protection money. They're all in prison now, and that was kind of the end of the Providence Mafia. There's really nothing left. Mm. Yeah. Now, when you had a, a tip or a story Talk a little bit about the process of when you had a, a story that you wanted to pitch to news director, assignment editors, how that went in television, and how it eventually, you know, were there any times that they say they said to you, well, you may not want to touch upon this type of issue? Well, they, they would never say, we don't want to touch upon this type of issue. I've never, I've never had that happen to me in my, I've been a reporter for 40 years. I never had that happen from any news director. Uh, they may say, you know, what's the chances of getting the story or what are the difficulties going to be in getting the story, but nothing was ever off, off limits at all. Uh, I, and I can tell you that the first story I talked about where I had to travel around the country, I, uh, it involved the Laborers International Union of North America. At the time, the president of that, that was the second largest union in the country, the president of that union happened to be a Providence resident, Arthur Coya Sr. And uh, I had a tip from someone who worked with the Laborers International Union, that it was corrupt, that it was being investigated by the FBI, and uh, this is over the phone. Uh, and I talked to him enough to confirm for myself that the guy was real, and, he, and he, I made some other phone calls, and he, and he did work for the Laborers International. So he wanted to meet me, to give me all this information about what was going on inside the Laborers International Union, uh, but he said I would have to take a couple plane flights because he was so afraid of being tracked down by somebody in the laborers, he was afraid I would be followed and then they'd end up killing him. So I went to my news director and I said, I have to go meet this guy, but I've got to fly someplace and then he's gonna tell me to fly someplace else. And he's looking at me like cross-eyed, my boss like, really? You know, you want me to play paint, plane tickets and hotel rooms? I said, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, so sure. he let me go and I flew um, from Providence to Denver. I got to Denver, I called his phone number. He said, fly to New Orleans and he was in New Orleans. So I meet him in New Orleans met him at a hotel, and this went on for over a year, traveling, meeting him in different places. Uh, we did the story, 
finally connecting the Labor's International to uh, the Mafia. Uh, I was sued for $22 million, uh, so was my station, uh, by the Labor's International. It was in the courts for nine and a half years, and the day I was to go to trial, they folded. So we won. So, so wow. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> any other story from your years covering the Mafia that, that you're particularly proud of? Meeting that hitman, um, I did a, a number of stories based on what he told me because now I was talking to somebody who was inside the mafia, and so he, what he, he it was a firsthand experience. Right. So I learned a lot from him about what it was like to be in the mob. It's nothing like the movies. It's nothing <laughs> like The Godfather. Uh, the, the the movie that came closest to portraying the mob was Goodfellas, um, because they're really not organized, even though they call it organized crime. <laughs> they're really not that smart. They have street smarts. And they're totally not sophisticated. Uh, but they will steal anything for the sake of stealing it. Um, that's how they make their money. They're a bunch of leeches. Uh, they don't care about people. Uh, I asked Nicky, I said, well, he had to kill his best friend who was his first hit. And I said, what was it like killing your best friend? He said, he just shrugged his shoulder and said, if I didn't do it, they killed me. He had to go, he had to go. And this is a kid he grew up with, his friends for like 20 years. Hmm. So there's a real missing part of their psyche yeah. You know, to be in the mob, it really is. They're just cold, cold-hearted people. Uh, it's not a life that, uh, you know, anybody would want to get into. Uh, Nicky dropped out of school when he was in the ninth grade. And I asked him about what got him into the, to the mob, you know, and he said, you know, from the time I was 14 or 15, I've never wanted for anything in my life because whatever I wanted, I would steal it. If I wanted a car, I would steal a car. If I yeah. wanted clothes, I'd steal a clothes. If I needed cash, I'd steal cash. If I need, you know, on and on and on. Matter of fact, he never had his first job until he was put into the witness protection program. He was 40-something years old. He, he's, uh, like I said, he was transferred out to California. He got a job in an amusement park. And he called me up to tell me he got his first job. And uh, Nikki's uh, expertise when he was in the mob was a safe cracker. I mean, it's old-fashioned, but he was a safe cracker. And he laughed. He says, you know, they, they put me in charge of the cash, the cash vault. And the, man, and, the, and, and the manager says, oh, let me give you the combination. He said, I almost said, I don't need the combination. What do I need it for? I said, you don't want to tell the guy you don't need the combination. You know, so. there's, there's always a lot of discussion that, um, particularly in, in a state like Rhode Island, where you hear of the mafia and government being in bed or together or this mm -hmm. influence. Did you ever see any of that? And if it, sure. if it was, how, was it as prevalent as, as some people make it out to be? It was fairly prevalent. Uh, there was this one time where uh, Mr. Patriarch's son, Junior, was trying to get into the University of Rhode Island. And uh, like I said, he wasn't, the, you know, not up there on the SATs, let's put it that way. Um, and so there was this governor, Governor John Noddy. And uh, this is, we know this is true because the FBI caught it on a bug. Uh, Patriarcha paid John Noddy $25,000 to get his son into the college, and he, and he got into the college. Um, and there's a number of, uh, Raymond Patriarcha, the boss, he had sheriffs in his back pocket. Uh, if there was a grand jury meeting, he would know what was going on in the grand jury. Uh, he had politicians in his back pocket, priests in his back pocket. Uh, so back then in that era, yeah, they, they, had, they had a lot of influence in government and other walks of life too, mm -hmm. for sure. I want to take the opportunity for anyone here to have a, a question for, for Jim. Please raise your hand. We can ask some questions. Well, I have plenty of time for more questions later. I just didn't want to keep going on a thread without uh, having <clears throat> the possibility of any questions asked. Anyone? Oh, I'm sorry, right in front. Steve, take the microphone, please. Yes. Yes, uh, with your experience in, in, in dealing with the mob, in today's politics, does the, the politicians are in the pocket of certain rich people to make things difficult for other people? It appears this way to me because of the things that is going on. Do you find that as well? Politicians uh, today are greatly influenced by corporations and unions, primarily. Um, you know, it, being in their pocket, probably some are. But uh, the, the, you know, the average person in this country has so little influence over our political system because it's the, the, the huge money makers, the huge uh, corporations, the big unions who have the lobbyists in Washington who meet with these guys every day. And uh, they all have a, a special interest in certain legislation. And those are the people who have so much influence in this country more than the citizen does, mm. sadly, I think. 
Any other questions before we move forward? That actually dovetails pretty well to uh, another, another story that you played a, a big role in, in uncovering, um, Operation Plunderdome, corruption in, in Providence uh, City Hall. Mm -hmm. For those of you who don't know, what was Operation Plunderdome? It was the FBI's investigation into the administration of uh, Mayor Vincent Buddy Cianci when he was mayor of Providence. Um, it was a four and a half year investigation, I believe. Mm. Uh, at the end of it, Buddy went to jail and about uh, eight other people in his administration went to jail. And they used a, uh, an informant, a Providence businessman, his name is Antonio Freitas. And they uh, got Freitas to carry a hidden camera and hidden, hidden audio equipment for over two years, meeting with a variety of city officials <laughs> and uh, taking, uh, paying bribes to these city officials to get things done. A lot of it was caught on uh, videotape. This is in the 90s, correct, primarily? Late 90s. Late 90s. Yeah. And of course, everything came to a head in early 2000s when uh, Mayor Cianti was uh, convicted of conspiracy. Right. Served uh, five years, I believe, five, just in about fed five years. federal prison. Yep. Uh, you became a, a, a key part of the story in that you had one of those videotapes right. of a bribe being accepted mm -hmm. by one of uh, Mayor Cianti's key personnel, right. correct? Yeah. What was yeah. that? Talk the uh, that. the FBI made about 120 hours of undercover videotape, and it caught all kinds of nasty things going on. One of the tapes uh, caught uh, this guy, Frank Carrenti, who was Mayor Cianci's director of administration, taking a $1,000 cash bribe and putting it in the drawer in his office, so he accepted a bribe. Uh, these tapes were put under seal by the federal judge, and that just simply means they weren't available to anybody in the public. The only people that could have access to those tapes, this is before the trials took place, were the attorneys for the defendants and the prosecutors. Uh, so every reporter in town was trying to get uh, their hands on these tapes. And I was lucky enough from a confidential source to get the tape of the cash bribe. It was the best tape out of the whole bunch of them. So we aired the tape and then uh, the federal judge uh, hired a special prosecutor to investigate me as to where I got the tape. And uh, as I said before, once you promise a source confidentiality, you can't ever you know, relinquish that. So um, after a two-year investigation, the judge found me in contempt for not disclosing my source, and he sentenced me to six months home confinement. So I was in home confinement for 121 days with one of those nifty ankle bracelets on. Uh, had to disconnect the internet, couldn't uh, take phone calls, confined to the inside of my house. I couldn't walk out the front door. So it was uh, a little testy. What was Pro that like? What was that like? I mean, what was, did you do? A lot uh, of reading? I learned how to clean floors really good. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, a lot of reading. Read 36, 37 books. I play guitar a little bit, so I drive myself nuts playing the guitar. W and, weren't allowed uh, any visitors as well, is that correct? I could have one visitor once a day for two hours that was needed to be approved by the U.S. Marshal's Office. They include so, your, your, your family? No, wife? No, 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 family's fine. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> no, <clears throat> but uh, the Marshal would drop by unannounced once a week, every week to see if I was taking drugs or drinking too much and all that stuff, so it's quite an experience. I would have gone to prison except that I had a heart transplant some yeah. years ago. Um, and so my doctors at Mass General wrote the judge and said if you put him in prison, it could be a death sentence because if you're an organ transplant recipient, your immune system's suppressed and the prison isn't the most healthy place to be. So luckily I got the home confinement instead of the prison. Talk, uh, you know, I was gonna bring <clears throat> that up later. Throughout all your years of, of covering the mafia and all these stories in the middle of it, you had a heart transplant. Yeah. Did you think about your job any differently? I wasn't thinking too much about my, my job. job. No, I, I mean, was, it's a, even, even when you came back, did you think that you needed to tone it down a little bit? No. No? No. I mean, I was so, anybody who, who is sick enough to need a heart transplant, um, after they get the heart transplant, you feel just, you feel like you're born again. Right. Uh, I can't describe how bad the sickness is, but this, this guy right here could. He's, this guy's name is, right. I just met him in the parking lot, Bob. Bob's waiting for a heart transplant. Um, you know, you, you're so bad, you're, you feel horrible, you can barely walk, and then you get the heart transplant and you're like back to normal. So um, after I recovered from the heart transplant, I went back to work and worked as hard as I ever did. Yeah. And so. hopefully, still good? Still vertical and breathing, still yeah. Still vertical and breathing. Yeah. Every day, every day uh, you awake, you're above ground is a good day. That's mm -hmm. what I've, I've heard before. Um, back to, to, uh, to Operation Plunderdome. Um, you've obviously covered Mayor Cianci he was mayor in the 70s and the early 80s, his first term uh, in office, then mm -hmm. again uh, in the 90s. Right. Um, what was your relationship with him? It's kind of this love-hate thing. Uh, I started covering him when I was working for that Providence Journal all-news radio station. 
Uh, and uh, lucky for me, I was engaged to his press secretary. So um, it was a real touchy situation because as a reporter, um, you know, I had my job to do, but you know, after hours, I was around my fiance. And um, so uh, I remember he called us in the office once and uh, using a, a whole bunch of four letter words, kind of chewed us both out about, you know, I, I don't want to see any stories, you know, behind the scenes on, on, on the air over at WAN. So uh, I got to know him really well. Um, and actually, um, I've done a lot of tough stories on him, including the plunder dump stories. And I'm on his radio show this afternoon at 4 o'clock <laughs> as his guest. He asked me to be on. So that tells you the kind of relationship it is. Uh, Buddy, Buddy is, uh, his attorney at the time said he got convicted, Buddy got convicted of being Buddy. Buddy was an outsized, uh, old-fashioned, big city mayor. He was like the old uh, the Mayor Daley from Chicago. Uh, he just uh, pushed his weight around, got things done. He could really get things done. Uh, and that's when he ran into trouble. So um, he's an interesting character. He's a he was a lawyer. He was a prosecutor. He was the only prosecutor in Rhode Island that ever put the mob boss in jail, Ray Patriarca, mm -hmm. as a young prosecutor. Right. He has a real appreciation for good journalism. He loves journalists. He loves being around us. That bar I talked about, Hopes, he was there with us at 2 o'clock in the morning shutting down the place. So he's, he's got a, an amazing, fascinating background. He's an amazing character. He's one of the most interesting people I've ever met in my life. Yeah. What about some of the other uh, politicians that you've covered, governors and the like? Um, were some of them more receptive to, to seeing a Jim Terracani? Is, is, is it one of those deals, and, and I always make this analogy, when you see 60 Minutes coming into the room, you're like, oh, it's 60 Minutes. What mm -hmm. are they, they going to ask me about? Is that the same thing? Is that kind of reputation? Did you get that kind of reputation, do you think? No. No? No. Nobody really worries about 60 Minutes anyhow. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> it's all maybe, myth. <laughs> maybe in the Mike Wallace days. Mm. But what about uh, dealing with other, with other politicians? Did you have better relationships with Poli some than politicians others? Politicians don't like the press because they don't like to, to have to explain themselves. Um, you know, they, once they get, before they get elected, they love the press okay. uh, because they're trying to get elected. Once they get elected, <laughs> they, change, they change overnight. Yeah. Uh, they don't want to hear from you. They want to talk to you, try to get an interview. They sh shoot down the interview. Um, it's not necessarily that they all have something to hide. It's just that they probably said so many things while they were trying to get elected that they no longer can uh, 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 do. You know, they make all these promises. They can't uphold the promises. Um, they, they're doing things behind the scenes that may not be illegal. There may be question, you know, ethical questions about it, so they don't want to answer to the press. So uh, it's always an adversarial relationship with, with the press and any politician, no matter what the rank, really. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's difficult. Yeah. Um, I want to get into a little bit more of, um, I want to cover one of your other stories that you covered that, that you, you really made a name for yourself. Um, this was in the late 70s, actually early 80s, Klaus von Bülow. Oh, yeah. Um, Klaus von Bülow, for those of you who do not know, is it was a, a British socialite who lived in Newport, Rhode Island, was accused of attempted murder of his wife, Sonny, who was in a coma for many years, right up until, I believe, Maybe about five, six years ago, I believe, when yeah, she, right. she finally passed away. Mm -hmm. um, you were able to, to befriend him in some ways in terms of a relationship. And there was a big trial, big nationwide trial coverage. And you ended up um, actually getting the first interview with him. Talk about mm -hmm. that, that event and how you were able to get that interview. This is a good lesson in how, how rich people can't relate to anybody else in the world and how they operate. Uh, Klaus stood trial twice for trying to kill his wife, Sonny, twice. And he was tr accused of trying to kill her by giving her injections of insulin. She was hypoglycemic. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's what he was accused of, twice trying to commit murder. His first trial was in Newport, Rhode Island, and he was found guilty. So he appealed his guilty conviction. The lawyer he hired to handle his appeal was Alan Dershowitz. Maybe some of you have heard of him. He's a very nationally known lawyer from, from Harvard University. So Alan um, uh, handled the appeal, and he actually won the appeal. Um, but while the appeal was pending, I was doing this half-hour show at Channel 10 called 10 Inside. It was an investigative show. And uh, we did a, a huge piece called City by the Sea. The sea was for cocaine. And we were trying to show that um, the jet setters in Newport were really using cocaine an awful lot. So one small part of that story, I stood in front of the Von Bulow Mansion, which is on Bellevue Avenue in Newport. And I said, I learned through a couple of law enforcement sources that while the first Von Bulow trial was going on, the Von Bulow children were throwing drug parties 
in the Von Bulow mansion. Now, Klaus Von Bulow's main line of defense was he was always trying to say that Sonny had other drugs in the house and she was trying to kill herself. So this was a big deal. So the Associated Press happened to pick up that little bit of the, uh, that story about the drugs being in the house and put it out on the Associated, Associated Press wire, which goes across the whole country. So the next day, it was printed in the, in the New York Post in New York. And now Klaus at the time was living in New York with his girlfriend, his girlfriend Andrea Reynolds. So I got a call one day in the newsroom from this Andrea Reynolds, who has a heavy Scandinavian accent, and said, introduced herself and said, you know, Klaus would like to talk to you about the story you did. And so I hung up on her because I thought this was a crank call. <laughs> so because um, no one calls out of the blue like that, you know. So she called back again and she said the same thing. So I'm Klaus von Buell's girlfriend. I said, yeah, I'm Santa Claus. And I hung up because in, in the newsroom, you get a lot of crank calls. So uh, finally, a local lawyer, a guy by the name of John Sheehan, who was Klaus von Bülow's local attorney for the first trial, he called me up about 15 minutes later and says, hey, look, idiot, that's really Andrea Reynolds, and you really should return the phone call. I said, okay. So I returned the phone call, and she said, uh, Klaus would like to meet you because uh, we'd like to talk about this uh, information you had about drugs being in the mansion during the first trial. I said, okay. So she said, if you can come to New York, we'll give you a 10-minute interview with Klaus. Now, at this time, this was an international trial, not just a national trial. Right. Every reporter in the world that covered this type of thing wanted to get an interview with Klaus von Bülow, and here I was going to get it. So we went down to uh, uh, Sonny, it was Sonny von Bülow's house on the Upper, uh, upper East Side in New York. She owned the whole top floor of this building. And uh, we were allowed to interview Klaus for 10 minutes, didn't say much of anything. So we got done with the interview, and so uh, Andrea Reynolds says, well, who were your sources that told you that the drugs were in the mansion? And I said, well, I can't tell you who my sources are. And she goes, oh, sure you can. And she took out a checkbook. She says, we can give you $20,000 for your sources. Uh. <laughs> I said, no, no, it does, doesn't work like that. You know, she says, $25,000 for your sources? I said, no, we, we don't take bribes. You know, reporters don't take bribes. She couldn't understand that. So she said, well, you go back and you think about it. And just name your price. We'll, we'll pay for the sources, you know. <laughs> so I called her back and I said, look, I, you know, I'm not going to give you my sources. I said, I'll go ask my sources if they want to voluntarily call you. you know. She said, okay. And I knew they wouldn't, and they, and they didn't. So for some reason, Klaus took a liking to me at that particular time. So when he got his second trial, a retrial, because he was successful on his appeal, when he came here, he knew myself as for a reporter from these, I, and I kept in touch with him over that year. Knew myself, Dominic Dunn, a very famous writer for Vanity Fair, and Barbara Walters uh, from ABC News. And so the trial uh, takes place, but I asked Klaus at the beginning of the trial, I said, if you're found not guilty, can I get the first interview? And he said, sure. So he's found not guilty. We whisk him off to our station. He sits down and does a half hour interview. Um, I'll never forget it because he smoked. Uh, they made a movie out of this called Reversal of Fortune. Uh, he smoked a cigarette in a certain way. And I finally got to ask him if he tried to kill his wife because no, he never took the witness stand, you know, and so I was found not guilty, wasn't I? You know, so, but it, it, was, it made big news. So um, Barbara Walters, he had also promised Barbara Walters the first interview, but I had the first interview. So um, that night, he flew to New York and did the interview with Barbara Walters, which was going to be aired two days later. So ABC <clears throat> put a promo on the air saying that Barbara Walters will have the first interview with Klaus von Bülow. And lucky for me, a guy from the USA Today who was covering the trial was still in Providence. And he saw the promo, and he called um, ABC News and says, you need to correct that. He says, this kid in Providence got the, the first interview. So uh, the ABC had to run a correction. It was on the first front page of the USA Today the next day. Small things turned reporters on, but you know, that was a good deal. Oh, yes. <clears throat> it's the little things. We and Klaus about. was weird. I mean, Klaus was the, a yeah. really weird it's guy. He, his boyfriend, J. Paul Getty Jr., actually financed the trial, I think, for him. Uh, he's, he's a bisexual, and now he's an art dealer in London for the Gay, uh, J. Paul Getty Foundation. Right. Still alive. Oh, yeah. 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 I want to spend the rest of our time to talk a little bit about um, journalism in general and, and where you see going forward. But one of the things I want to just tie all this into is uh, you talk about sources and protecting sources. Uh, again, you were in, under home confinement for four months to right. protect the source. Mm. You've also been very outspoken in trying to get shield laws passed right. to protect journalists. Um, talk about what shield laws are for students who may not know what they are and how important it is to protect journalists, similar to doctors and lawyers 
who have you know confidentiality issues. Right. Um, and any any reporter, no matter what you're reporting on, you know, sooner or later you're probably going to need a confidential source. Uh, sometimes there's just information you can't get through public record or public comment on. So if you really want to do your job, you're going to have to develop these sources. And it's extremely important that once you promise the confidentiality that you uphold it. Uh, as soon as you don't, you're probably not going to get many more sources. So 38 states, including Massachusetts and Rhode Island, um, have shield laws for reporters, but the federal government doesn't have a shield law. And so after my case, we were owned by NBC News at the time. Our station was owned by NBC. They put me on this kind of tour with two other reporters, um, uh, Matt Cooper from Time Magazine and um, the woman from um, uh, the New York Times, Judy Miller. Judy Miller. And uh, Judy Miller and Matt Cooper uh, were in a similar situation as I. They were protecting uh, sources when they did this report about Valerie Plain and the CIA. Mm -hmm. And so we, we lectured at college universities, we debated prosecutors, trying to build support for um, a federal shield law to be passed. And I ended up testifying before Congress in 2007, I think, uh, before the House Judiciary Committee in, in hopes of getting this law passed. It's been passed in the Senate, it's awaiting approval in the House, uh, but we still don't have it. So without those protections, uh, what happened to me can happen to other reporters. If you promise a confidential source, and you're investigated for it, and you, you don't give it up, you're going to get either a prison sentence or a home confinement sentence. So, you know, in my opinion, you know, we have a free press in this country. It's either free or it's not free. And so if it's going to be free, then we have to have the ability to do our jobs, and uh, we have, that includes confidential sources. Now, did Rhode Island have the shield law? In, yeah. But it was because it was a federal, federal case. case right. That's why didn't you were apply. Right. didn't apply. In the <clears throat> case. Right. I, want to, I want to ask a, a question of the audience, so if we can get the, the shot from our, our audience camera. And I want you to be honest, raise your hand. How many of you here in the audience watch local television news, let's say, at least three times a week? Raise your hands. Really? That's actually, that's, that's that's actually not bad. Yeah. That's amazing. You, you, you're, you're it's about, age, about half the room. Your age group room. really doesn't watch news a lot. I've, I've been to colleges where no one raised their hand. Uh, it's not a bad thing that you no, don't watch. No, it's a good thing. <laughs> it's not a bad thing because TV news has been... Uh, the quality of TV news has really gone down over the years. Uh, it's because audiences are dwindling, like newspaper readership is dwindling. So you have to go for kind of the lowest common denominator. Uh, it means a lot more entertainment style news, a lot more hype, a lot more sensationalism to try to attract viewers. So uh, there's been lots of changes like that over the years. Did that yeah. impact how you cover things? Uh, probably it not did, as much. You know, they, don't, they, lead, they, they tend to use the investigative teams now as they see we, we've got this legitimate news going on right, you know right. so we're going to do all this nutty stuff but we got these guys over here right so um but uh everything's on the web now uh that's where most people uh, especially in your age group get their information um me, me too by the way channel 10 had a had a reporter julie tremel yes and you commented about her her uh, antics if mm. you will mm -hmm. um she was let go by by the uh, by the station recently over doing some things that some journalists may see as a little more uh, show? Is that fair to say, in, in your opinion? In, are you, in my opinion. You, you, you responded negatively to what she had done. I did, but you know, that was a mistake on my part because I was responding to a friend on Facebook and not okay. being really an expert on Facebook. I thought I was responding privately and it didn't end up privately. Go local prov, put it on in a very big way, okay. uh, which is out of character for me because I never talk about people at the station right. publicly. You know, uh, d Did I think that type of a stand-up, uh, she was showing a, yeah. how to defend uh, yourself against a bear attack. Uh, and it got, it got, in my opinion, a little over the line. It was a little bit too, sh too much showmanship. And that's the opinion I expressed. Um, others thought differently, obviously. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, she was eventually let go from the station, but uh, I can tell you, I don't know why. Our right. station never said why. Uh, the, we're, we're a station, we're, we're represented by a union. It's very difficult to uh, fire someone in a union shop, uh, so I don't know why. But those types mm -hmm. of, of, of reporting tactics are, are what, unfortunately, news directors... Are, you know, are, but some people like them. Exactly, right. yeah. Right, I mean, she got a lot of favorable comment from viewers. Right. So, you know, that, that's telling about what audiences find acceptable nowadays as opposed to maybe 20 years ago they wouldn't. Yeah. Mm. We talked a little bit before we got mm. started today that um, just the, the process of, of gathering television news has changed. 
when you started, uh, there was usually a reporter and a photographer that would run one of the cameras. Right. Now a lot of it is being done by one-man bands, media journalists. Right. Um, some journalists even use cell phones right. to do things. Right. Um, for the better, for the worse, what do you think? In some uh, respects. Well, um, it's, it's getting better because photography is, is so different than writing a news story. And um, up until a few years ago, the people who were doing these one-man bands, which means you write, shoot, and edit everything yourself, uh, they weren't really trained properly to do that. So the photography and the editing was usually horrible because they were just they, they knew how to push a button on a camera, aim it, shoot, and edit. And those two things are really an art in itself, you know. Um, but now uh, students are being trained quite well in mm -hmm. colleges on how to do that. Right. So the, the, the recent digital journalists we've hired at Channel 10 are, are excellent at it. They're, they're very good. Mm -hmm. And they're good editors, they're good photographers, they're good writers, they're good reporters. So it's really moving in that direction because it's cost effective. Uh, it, it's a lot cheaper for a station to have one person doing all those jobs than hiring a photographer and a reporter to do that job. Uh, you can't do as many stories during the day when you're a one-man band because it just takes time. But I think that's where it's all going to end up is, a, is digital journalism. How difficult mm. is it today for a station like, uh, like Channel 10? You were there for 30 plus years. You still have people like Patrice Wood who's been there mm. just as long, I think. One year less than me. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and some of those stations, there's so, such so high turnover. <clears throat> In terms of investigative reporting, um, does the reporting suffer in some respects because there's no, no time for a lot of these reporters to develop sources, to develop stories because they're there and then in a place like Providence, it is a springboard for many journalists right. to go to larger markets. Right. Yeah, um, it's uh, like they're having a hard time now. They're, they're going to hire a replacement for me, but you've got to get somebody who's got some local knowledge because right. it takes a long time <clears throat> to do investigative reporting, to build up those sources, to build up those contacts, to find out all the nuances of what's going on in a given market. Uh, but it can be done. You know, I mean, new, new people come in all the time, and you work at it, and, and, and you get it done. Mm. You know, so uh, it's not impossible. Right. right. But mm -hmm. is it, would, I would think Channel 10 would look for someone who maybe have been, has been in the market a little longer than a fresh face. Well, if they hire the woman uh, that I suggested, right. they'll be fine. Oh, good. <laughs> Excellent. So we'll look forward to seeing who that person is relatively soon. Let me ask you your, your opinion of, of, of television journalism uh, in general. Um, it has definitely evolved. It's definitely, as, as you said, and, and a lot of us have, have said, it, it's, it skews to an older demographic. There's no doubt about that. Right. Um, I'm, I'm in my late 40s, and I still rarely watch a full newscast at mm -hmm. night uh, mm -hmm. because we can get our information on one of these or on an iPad. Um, where do you see local journalism television journalism going, say, in the next five, ten years? It's going to go to the web, for sure. Almost the business model, meaning their advertising model, it just doesn't work that well anymore, and that's what's happening to newspapers. Nobody has to wait around for a 6 o'clock newscast or an 11 o'clock newscast, and no one has to w wait around for their morning newspaper to find out when, uh, what went on in their community, in the state, in the country, or the world. So um, that's really cutting into readership for newspapers, and viewership for, uh, for television, for sure. We still have good ratings, and that's what the advertising is based on, but uh, like if we get a 10 rating now, that's a, for our six o'clock news, which is still kind of the main newscast, that's a real good rating. 10 years ago, that would have been a 20 rating. Right. So it, you can just see the audience is going down because we all carry around one of these. You know, and if you need to know something, you click on it and it's done. You don't have to wait for an anchor man or anchor woman to read the news to you at six o'clock. Mm. Yeah. Is there also some added pressure, and maybe you may have seen this toward the end of your career as an investigative journalist in the 24-7 news cycles that we've been living on now for quite a while. Mm. Was there any more pressure on you to maybe break something sooner than you may have wanted because other reporters may be working that story and maybe getting it out sooner as well? Not especially because in investigative reporting, you really don't know what the other person's working on. Right. You know, that happens in general assignment reporting where right. you, you know something's happening and all three TV stations know about it and the mm -hmm. first one to get it's going to get right. that, you know, the exclusive thing. But, uh, you know, you're kind of doing your own thing in the investigative unit. So there's, and, and you, they can't pressure you to put it on because if the story's not ready, 
it's not ready. It's not ready. Right. right. Yeah. And they know a lawsuit can happen quite easily if you put some half-baked story on the air. Well, we see right. that now. Uh, there, there's such a need to be first yeah. and not necessarily yeah. a, a, an urge to be right. And it's burned. Yeah. It's burned, it's burned some people. No yeah. about That's that. a lot of the uh, self-promotion the TV right. stations have to do to try to get viewers. You know, you've seen the, the breaking news and we got this first and we got the best weather. And it goes on and on and on. You know, it's all silliness, actually. Willing to <clears throat> solicit any more questions from our room here? Yeah, right, right here, Joyce, right. Let me get, wait for the microphone, please. Thank you. Oh, right here, right, right in front of you, Joyce. Right below you. Yes. Hi. Uh, very interesting, by the way. Um, I watch CNN and Fox News, and it seems to me that the reporters, there's a lot of them that are lawyers or have a law degree. Is that something new? Where they have a law degree first and then they become investigative reporters? Um, it's, it's not necessarily new, but if you're, if you're trying to get to a network in your career, there's nothing better than having a real uh, defined specialty. So if you're a lawyer, doctor, you see a lot of the medical reporters now, and you can translate that into you know, being a good, a good person on TV, you've got a leg up on somebody else. For example, if you want to cover the Supreme Court or you want to be a legal correspondent for, say, NBC News, if you have a law degree, you've got it way up over the, the, the average reporter who's going to apply to cover the courts. Mm -hmm. you know? and, so, uh, and plus, they get paid more. They, they can demand more on a contract because, look, I'm, I'm a lawyer, you know. So, yeah, it's, uh, that happens a lot now. Yeah. Any other questions? Right, right here. Down in front. Uh, Joyce, we have it here. I got it. Shelly's got it. <clears throat> uh, thank you for the opportunity. First of all, I'm uh, old enough to remember all the stories. But uh, <laughs> in regards to the S.H.I.E.L.D. law, uh, a journalist years ago was more easily defined than it is today. I'm not up much on technology, but everybody has these blogs or things that you can publish online. Uh, is it a situation developing where almost anybody can use, a in a state that has it, a shield law <coughs> by simply writing your own column, writing your own blog, Question. to cover or protect someone from something? Most of the state shield laws and the, uh, the law that's being proposed on the federal level, which is called the Free Flow of Information Act, there is a definition of journalism in there. And it pretty much says if, if you're acting in a way that disseminates information to the public on a, on a fairly larger scale other than like telling your neighbor about it, you know, uh, the judge will deem you a journalist. But it's all going to be up to a judge. And that'll be part of the hearing process. For example, a lot of bloggers do some pretty good reporting. Yeah. You know, and so you know, if you're doing that, if you're doing reporting, and you're out there gathering facts, and you're putting together, and it's not not necessarily an opinion piece, and you're disseminating that to a wide audience, you know, you're probably going to be judged a journalist. The downside of that is, if you're not working for a news organization, and you're an independent journalist, and you get sued like I did, or investigated like I did, the legal costs to defend that are tremendous. My legal case in my two-year investigation cost NBC News $700,000. Mm. So if you're an independent blogger and you are under investigation for you know, your source, that's probably a one to two year process before you even get sentenced. Well, you've got to have a lawyer representing you. Right. And that costs a lot of money. And there's, a, there's also mm. a number of, of news organizations that are actually asking people, right? You're at the scene. Sh Tweet us a photo of the fire. Oh, right. Tweet us, right. you know, take some video of what you right. see and send it to right. Channel 10, Channel 12. Right. So there's, there's some responsibility there well. The, as well. the onus, right. you know, if, if, you, if you were out there seeing a yeah. fire and you sent, you sent the video to us, the onus is on us because we're broadcasting it. Correct. It's not on you. Right. 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 Any other questions? Yes. Just wait for the microphone. Thank you. Um, I think I noticed this more like um, when there was the Boston Marathon bombing um, and the Sandy Hook shooting is that I didn't know what was true and what wasn't true because I had Facebook, I had Twitter, I had my, like, my friends texting me. Do you think social media has made it um, more difficult as a reporter to kind of express what is true and what is not true to the audience? Yeah, it's a great question, um, especially in those live situations, those, uh, you know, the, the real breaking news situations. Uh, every station and every network tries to get the information on first, which is really dangerous. 
a dear friend of mine, John King from CNN, I used to work with him here in Providence. Uh, he made a real fool out of himself by putting out a lot of wrong information based on some cop he was talking to in the Boston Police Department. Uh, and that's why he lost his show, by the way, on CNN. Um, like 24 hour right. And they've so got to they, they've got to fill the time. They've got to have something to say. And that's when reporters who are not thinking really well on their feet are likely to say a lot of things that aren't necessarily accurate. And that happens in these big events that you see where it's being covered live like that. It's better just to say we don't know. Right. You know, we, we don't know. We're waiting for information or we're trying to get information. The better reporters do that. But you've got bosses and producers and executive producers talking in your ear in your earpiece, you know, NBC just reported this. What, get it, get it, get it. You know, and that's what happens. And it's it's shame. It's just shameful, really. You just don't know what to believe until a day later, perhaps. You know. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> Any other questions? Oh, Joyce, at the end of your row. Well, Joyce is uh, getting her exercise in today. <laughs> and Joyce has no balance. <laughs> Watch out. Yes. To us today. Sure. Um, I was just wondering, you're talking a lot about the culture of corruption in Rhode Island and something that I think probably still exists today with what's going on with whatever is going on with Pretty Gordon much, Fox. Yeah. Right. And I'm just wondering, you know, if there isn't um, a network that's supporting investigating report uh, reporting in the state, um, you know, who's going to pick that up? It, you know. Well. Uh, Rhode Island's pretty lucky, actually, because Channel 10 is certainly uh, has a dedicated has dedicated a lot of resources to their investigative team. They have Katie Davis and Parker Gavigan are still on the team. They're two reporters, plus a producer, plus a photographer. Uh, Channel 12 has an excellent team. Tim White, who's Jack White's son, by the way, the guy who was my mentor, um, uh, Dan McGowan and Ted Nisi, and they have their own reporter, uh, photographer, and producer. And Channel 6 has Mark Curtis, who also does that. You have excellent investigative reporters at the Providence Journal. You have Jim Hummel, who does uh, the independent investigative reporting for WPRO and his own foundation. So Rhode Island's kind of lucky in a way that it still has organizations that support investigative reporting in, a, in kind of a big way. You know, uh, other markets aren't like that for sure. So around, and in Boston too, they support investigative reporting. The Globe's got an excellent team and all the TV stations up there have investigative uh, people. So in this area of the country, uh, it still sells pretty well, and, and, and I think that the, the public served pretty well by the investigative reporters that are out there. Right. And you also have the Providence Journal still. Yeah, obviously. I said the Providence Journal is still uh, built. Also lacking money, right? So well, oh yeah, I mean that, that they used to have. And Mike Stanton, who was the Pulitzer Prize winner, left there recently. He's now a professor at UConn. Bill Malinowski is still there. Kathy Gregg from the State House. They have some really good reporters there. Katie Mulvaney. Yeah. yeah. Other questions. Oh, one more back, back down here for Steve. While, while, while Joyce is getting down there, take your time. You know, one of the things, one of the things Jim, that, that we can still say is that even though, you know, viewership numbers may not be where they were on television, uh, eyeballs may not be what, where they were in, in newspaper, I think there's still a need and a, a, a thirst and a hunger for good journalism. And I think that's always going to continue. Oh, sure there is. You know, I mean, there's tons of great stuff being do done on the web, you know, and, and so many, you know, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, uh, there's a slew of papers online uh, that are doing a, a great job. And they're now developing separate staffs for the online and the mainstream newspaper. And so, and there's, and there's a lot of uh, independent reporting going on outside of Rhode Island. So uh, it'll always be there. And I mean, there's, in this country, in our democracy, you know, if you, if you free press, uh, there, there's a line, there's a wall between, you know, anarchy and, 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 and freedom. And the press is right there. And if, if you don't have a free press in this country, God help us, because nobody else is watching these clowns in Washington or, or locally. Right. So. The platforms may change. Yeah, all oh, the platforms will definitely change. change right. yeah. Steve. Yes, sir. And, and journalism nowadays, when you listen to certain um, TV station, you get a lot of mediocre news. And uh, when you try to research it, you found no answers for it. Um, what, what is your um, recommendation for young journalists like those are in here? How they proceed to, to, to give um, people the truth? And the other thing is, where do you see journalism going for younger people today? 
I think if, if uh, someone, you know, your age uh, wants to get into journalism, first of all, you should be really well read and well rounded in a lot of different areas, nothing really specific. But uh, good journalism is always based on history. Yeah. It's what you know about what took place before you sat down and typed one word. So um, that's a real critical part of it. And having a desire to serve the public. I mean, that's what journalism is. Uh, and, and so it's not, uh, being on TV is not glamorous. It may look glamorous to some people, but it's not glamorous. And there's a lot of people getting into TV now for all the wrong reasons. They're looking for TV to be a stepping stone to uh, an entertainment show. Uh, but journalism is a serious business. Um, it takes a lot of work. A lot of it's boring work. There's not a lot of excitement to it most of the time. Uh, but it's, it's, there's a real need in this country for good journalists. And uh, there'll always be spaces for good journalism. Uh, Absolutely. You know, newspapers and TV, like I said, it may be a different platform, right. but they're going to be there. Uh, we've got the, the greatest free press in the world in this country, so if anybody's interested in getting into it, I would, you know, encourage you to pursue it and, uh, you know, work hard at it. And uh, you can be successful, as successful as you want to be in the business. Uh, but it just takes a good, like, liberal arts type of a background to be a good journalist. Uh, that's, that's the most important thing I tell everybody. Read a lot, leave your mind open to a lot, a lot of different points of views, you know, because that'll make you a better journalist for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions? Did you have a question? Anyone else have a question? No? Okay. Well, I think we will, uh, we will end it here. A good way to end it, uh, the future of journalism. And, uh, and we want to, again, thank Jim Terracani for joining sure. us today. Jim, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you thank all you. for coming. <laughs>